Let's go. Let's get it. Two p.m. Got the link. We here, and she here. Let's go. Dory, how we doing? Hi there. I'm great. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good on this wonderful Monday evening afternoon to you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, um, nice to meet you. It's a pleasure to meet you as well. Um, I just want to say thank you for allocating your time to me. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, um, thank you for being flexible. I'm sorry yesterday just ended up being such a hectic day, but I'm glad we were able to reschedule it fast. No, you're good. You're absolutely good. Listen, you, you're you in season, so I understand that everything is going on, so it's all good. Um, I also want to ask you, how are you and your family doing during these pandemic times? We're fortunately doing very well. I appreciate you asking that. Um, so like I have a like older um, parents and gra a grandparent that's still around and uh, you know, it's always like kind of a scary thing when that's the case, but they've been really great. So I hope that yours are too. How's your family? Oh uh, yeah, my, my mom, my aunt, my uncle, they live an hour away from me. Uh, they're doing pretty good, knock on wood. My dad, my stepmom and my little brother are um, upstate New York. Um, so they're doing pretty good. And I got family all scattered around in, in various places, but knock on wood, nobody has uh, gotten the COVID-19. So that's a blessing. To the guy. That's amazing, especially like considering what a like hotbed New York was. Like, I'm so happy to hear that. That's great. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much for asking. I do appreciate it. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on me. Um, and then I'm going to also let you know why I reached out to you. So... I am a senior in college. I go to Kennesaw State University here in Kennesaw, Georgia, about 20 miles from Atlanta. Um, I am a journalism and emerging media major. I am a staff writer at our school magazine. I am a sports co-host at uh, our sports radio station with uh, two other guys. So we all do a show called The Swoop. Um, it's on Wednesdays from two to four. Uh, I've also covered high school football as a sports writer, sports correspondent. Uh, this past fall, I did 11 games. Um, I'm going to be doing high school basketball upcoming in a couple of weeks, doing the same thing, writing for publications. Um, so I've done a lot of sports writing. I haven't got a lot in front of the camera yet, but I'm actually going to be doing some packages in class very soon, learning how to do some B socks and uh, this, that, and the third. Uh, so I'm excited to do that. Um, but mainly I've done sports writing for sure. Uh, I wanted to reach out to you because I saw one that you are a sports reporter for the Las Vegas Knights, I believe. Uh, and then that's one of my favorite sports, hockey, along with basketball, football, baseball. Number two, uh, you are in one of the, to me, top markets. I mean, who, who doesn't like to be in Vegas uh, and doing exactly what they love to do? That's a market that I could definitely see myself living in. I am a West Coast kid by heart. I was, I grew up in San Diego, California. Um, so I'm definitely used to the West Coast and definitely used to Vegas. I've seen a bunch of your reels. I think you do an amazing job at what you do. Uh, so it was a no brainer for me to talk to you because I want to talk to uh, someone who I feel is one of the best at her position. Um, I also uh, just wanted to kind of, you know, pick your brain, hear about your experiences, be a sponge, any advice or, uh, you know, anything that you would have or anything you want to share about your experiences coming up into the sports media field. But like I said, it was a no brainer for me to reach out to you and I'm blessed that you actually uh, responded back. I really do appreciate it. Oh, thank you. You're so kind. I really appreciate those thoughtful words. That's so nice of you to say. Um, and great to hear a little bit about your background. It sounds like you are doing a little bit of everything. I know that writing has been your primary focus so far, but you're involved in a lot of different platforms and getting out there and talking to other people in different areas of the profession, I think is great. And 
um, an awesome, awesome place for you to kind of figure out what feels right for you and what you want to ultimately end up doing. And I too actually used to live in San Diego. I went to San Diego State for college and my first real taste actually of like working in the sports media field was covering high school football out there. Okay. So you already know how that, how that was. Uh, I went to Kearney High School out there. It wasn't really a powerhouse, but, you know, I played football. I could say that for high school, so for sure. That's there awesome. You go. I love it. San Diego State, that's awesome. I love it. So without any further ado, let me ask you, what made you or inspired you to want to become a sports reporter? Well, so it's kind of a wonky situation. I think that like I've always been a big sports fan. Like I grew up watching and playing just about everything growing up. Um, my dad is a former like minor league baseball player and my mom was a gymnast. And so they always really instilled sports in my life growing up. Um, yeah. but, but I never really thought it was something I would work in to be honest with you. Like I loved, like I had a total fascination with watching female hosts on television I just thought they were tremendous like I I really I thought it was so cool to see women doing that type of a job but I never thought it was something I would actually do <laughs> and so I went to college thinking I was going to be a nursing major and was taking kind of like medical prerequisites early on in college and ended up taking a radio television elective where I just totally caught the bug for tv and was like okay, I'm, this is what I'm supposed to do. And my dad kind of encouraged me that it's something that you have a natural feel for and you obviously love sports and you have your whole life. And if you were ever gonna pursue this, I mean, you might as well try it while you're young because it's not gonna be good if you change your mind at like 30 or 40. So right. if you're gonna go for it, then go for it. And I really just dove in head first and changed my entire course load was taking um, I went to a junior college at the same time that I was at San Diego State to get all of the credits in that I could. And um, yeah, I just kind of took off from there. So I always loved it and always thought that it would be a cool job. I just never really thought that I would. Um, and now it's so bizarre because I can't imagine doing anything else. I think about it all the time. I'm like, I don't know what I would do if this didn't work out. <laughs> I just, I love it and I'm so happy doing it. And I feel like not a lot of people in the world get to wake up every day and go to work doing something that they love. And so it's something I really don't take for granted. Oh yeah, that last part right there is absolutely key. That definitely resonates with me because there's definitely a whole lot of crappy type of jobs out there to be doing. You know, uh, people got to do it to pay the bills and a plethora of reasons, but you're waking up and, you know, it's encouraging um, and it's inspiring, you know, to see more women just period, you know, uh, women in the industry doing this because they're just as good as what, as what us do, as what men do. And I've always felt that. I've never felt it was a male dominated kind of industry, although maybe statistics might show that. But I always felt that women are just as good at hosting and analyzing and reporting. It's just as great. And plus, you guys naturally articulate better than we do anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it is that's what it is on that. So, that's great that you wanted to, that you switch careers like that. It's pretty cool. So, okay. Well, um, now, you said you switched at San Diego State while you were there. Did you do any internships that helped you in your current role that you have now? Yeah, so my first internship ever was not even in sports. It was in the programming department at the CBS affiliate out in San Diego, just because I was trying to get a feel for like how TV gets on the air essentially. And so I did all the grunt work there, logging clips and following around reporters and producers and hanging out in the control room, just trying to learn what all the different jobs were in television. And then, um, like I kind of mentioned to you earlier, my first real opportunity covering sports out there was covering high school football in North County, San Diego. And that was through the junior college actually that I went to while I was at San Diego State. So Palomar College has a really ah. good broadcast program there. Yeah. And they would do a weekly show called Prep Sports Live. And I basically would go out to a high school football game every Friday with my own camera and tripod and I'd shoot the game and I'd 
do a one man band stand up before the game and after the game. And I'd shoot a interview with the coach of the winning team. And then I would create a package and like a highlight um, package and put it in the show um, that would air on Tuesdays. And so it was just a really good learning experience of like how to shoot, write and edit and um, like really do it all yourself. And those are total, totally tools that I have used throughout every job that I have had up to now with the Vegas Golden Knights. Even recently, right now, um, I'm embedded with our hockey team right now. And so I'm very fortunate to be on the travel party with the Vegas Golden Knights this year in their like mini bubble situation right. that they have. Right. And because of that, we're much more short staffed inside the bubble in terms of like people that are allocated to do certain jobs. And I even shot recently, like I hadn't shot in a year and a half, but because I had those tools and we were down another person, they just handed me a camera and said, hey, can you shoot this today? And I did, and I was so glad I didn't mess it up. But <laughs> <laughs> like, that's a, that's a skill that <laughs> like, I'm so fortunate that I had from back in college and that I used through my other jobs that even though now in this job where I'm primarily on air 99% of the time that yeah. when called upon to do other thing I could still do it so I didn't lie on the resume good stuff <laughs> I like that that's awesome that's awesome that you got that experience though with the being the MMJ basically and being a one person like wow that's a lot it's a lot to do carry the tripod carry the camera set the camera up set this shoot this and I'm like, I can wow that's kudos to you there's no question about that um the next uh, uh question that I have is what is the most rewarding thing about your job but what is also the most challenging thing about your job oh that's hard <laughs> um there's a lot of rewarding things i think especially when you get to tell an important story um i think something about being that conduit and and being the person that is able to hopefully ask questions that invoke the types of responses that really tell the story in a good way Right. Um, and that makes the subject and the people around the subject proud. Um, so, so I think that's definitely like a very rewarding aspect of the job. And, um, and another just kind of cool personal like type of a rewarded, rewarding feeling I feel is that, especially in the job that I have now working in the NHL where you're talking to athletes who are at the absolute peak of their profession and the best in the world at what they do and getting that immediate insight of like what they were feeling in a moment i feel like is a really unique part of my job that a lot of people don't get to experience and it's a really really cool um unique aspect of the job and then as far as the most challenging there's a lot of really hard parts too that i think a lot of people don't necessarily think about being challenging um but like a sideline reporter for example in any sport I'll use football as this example because it's usually like the toughest one for me is that you prepare like so many stories to go into a game that maybe two of them will see the light of day and you prepare and you just prepare so much because you have to be so knowledgeable about both teams that in football obviously have very large rosters but you need yeah. to know a little bit of backstory of the third string quarterback and how his mom inspired his career because you never know if that player could get in right. and you know it's just a lot of background information that you have to have at the tip of your fingers in case you need it you probably won't but in case you do you have to have it um and so to know in a football broadcast you're only going to get this 30 second snippet to try to succinctly tell a very important story um, that you really have to take advantage of your moments. And you also really have to be on your toes because while you prepare all these stories, the game tells the story. And right. you have to be running around, tracking down injuries, um, reading coaches' lips and gauging what an, a, an emotional impact is having in which position group as you go throughout the course of the game. So I think one of the most challenging things is just being able to put in all of the preparation, but knowing that most of what you're going to be reporting is information on your toes and you have to do it in a very succinct 30 second soundbite. 
Wow, that's uh, I think that's the first time that I've ever heard of a challenge like that. And you know, it, it, it's not to say that other reporters and other people don't experience that challenge, but you know, it's really good to hear that coming from you because it's like, man, that's that's real. Like you on that sideline, and you do gotta hustle, you do gotta move, and you know, we're talking about temperature. Sometimes it's very cold. We're talking about what what, what you have on as far as boots. Or maybe uh, you know, maybe sneakers. Maybe the ground is icy, depending on where you at. Uh, stuff I like that. I can't believe I didn't even. I can't believe, Chris, I didn't even include that. Yes, the elements you have to brave because yeah, yeah. I've been like as sweaty as can be, getting a sunburn deep down in humidity, yeah. or I've been in ten degrees, snowing, can hardly open my mouth to speak, or like just torrential downpours of rain. Like that's totally. <laughs> another added element of a challenge you're you're dead on yeah yeah that's that's all i was thinking about while you was talking i mean the 30 the 30 seconds for sure obviously condensed information with what you prepare for and you said that most of the stories go by the wayside and you got to know specific stories at specific times but all i'm thinking about is the, the literally the elements i mean in vegas it gets hot it gets it gets hot in vegas in september uh there's no question or, or if you're inside you know, doing a nice game that, you know, down below gets cold. I, I, I used to cover college hockey. That penalty box is cold. I mean, it don't matter if you got a sweater on or not. It's freezing down there. Um, so I know for sure what you're talking about when you talk about challenges. It's pretty, that's pretty amazing. Okay. But I like that answer. Ooh, excuse me. The next answer I'm going to, or next question I should ask is about social life. Um, and the reason why I ask this is because you know, a lot of times you go 125 miles per hour in this industry. Sports is every day. Sports is nights and weekends, holidays, whatever. Uh, and you don't get a time to spend time with your loved ones, your family, maybe your significant other, if you have one. Uh, maybe, um, you know, your friends. You miss out on weddings, parties, important events. Um, I know my social life is taking a, a, a dive. I don't even want to say dip. It's just dive. Um, no question about it. It's non-existent. My dating life is even worse. Uh, and it's tough because when you have friends that are not in the journalistic realm or that's not in the same like major as you, they really don't understand <laughs> like deadlines, like articles have to be done at certain times, or you have to cover games, you have to prep. They don't understand. It takes time. And it's like somebody doing a nine to five trying to come into this world. It's like completely different. We don't work nine to five. We work all kinds of hours because it's based upon the event. It's not based upon the hours. Um, and it's tough because, you know, with the dating situation, again, you're trying to date somebody that's on the outside. And, you know, I'll just tell you a quick story before I let you answer. Had a date a couple months ago. We went out to dinner. The editor gave me the night off. I was covering high school football, as I told you, and I had covered like five games in a row. And I'm like, okay, cool. And we're at dinner. Dinner's going great. All of a sudden, my phone rings. I pick up. It's my sports editor. I said, hey, I got to take this. I said, hello? He says, hey, man, someone called out sick. Can you please cover uh, a sport? Can you please cover this high school game, football game? It was a big high school game because both teams were undefeated. So it was one of those big time games. I looked over at her and I said, I got to go. I'm sorry. Now, mind you, prior to the date, I told her I'm a sports correspondent and I'm right. So I did what's up front. She responded like this. I told her I got to go. She said, oh, so you leaving? I was like, yeah, I got to go cover the game. I'm sorry. My apologies. I really am. We oh, definitely should do this again. She's like, so you're going to break the date? said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I have to go cover the football game for my job. And she was like, I said, we can do this again. And she was like, don't bother. And I said, oh, okay, I understand. So I say that because how do you balance your work, social, dating life, being able to see friends and family and stuff like that? I'm terrible at it too. <laughs> so <laughs> I am. No, oh, truly. Like that bums me out to hear that, but clearly she wasn't the one. So you'll clearly. find somebody that that'll fit um, and that'll understand. And I mean, I've been in a relationship for the last five years and it's still a struggle. Okay. Like it's, it's still something that like we have to 
work on actively and making sure that like that when I'm home, I'm present because I am so focused on my work and I am so passionate about what I do. And yeah. I put such a priority on preparation that at times that can take over my home life too. And so that's something, like I said, I'm constantly working on. And right now it's an even bigger challenge because like I said, I am in that bubble right now, essentially, um, where I can't go out. Like I go to the rink or the arena or on the plane with the team into the hotel, into the rink and nowhere else. So I don't go to the grocery store. I don't go see other friends. I can't really see my family um, outside of my significant other who I live with. Um, and it's really hard <laughs> um, and even harder now than it is under my normal being a psycho about work type of a scenario because I physically can't go do these things. Right. Um, and it's not easy and it takes a special partner to be able to understand that like I don't work Monday through Friday. I lose track of what day of the week it is all the time because I work so many weekends. Right. Um, basically my, my week is game day or non-game day. That's <laughs> how so we kind of um, arrange my schedule. Right. And so like as far as family relationships and stuff, I've been in the industry now for about seven years and I am kind of only just now really, really putting an emphasis on prioritizing my relationships. And it's, it's such a hard balancing act. I think early on, and even now I battle with it is just, I'm, I'm very much so a go getter and I want to find success in my job because my job is a big part of what makes me happy. Right. But I also have to understand like personal relationships are very fulfilling also. And that those deserve just as much of my attention as my job does, because one day my job's not going to be there for me anymore, but my family will be. And right. so like, right. it's, it's a very tough balancing act, but I'm fortunate to have good people in my corner that do support me and, and love that I get to do something that I enjoy and that I love and that I do put all of the effort into it that I do. And for, for you in your life, I'm sure like you'll see this as you go to it just, it takes special people um, to surround yourself with that understand that. And then once you have that, it helps create such a foundation and they help ground you and they help balance you out when you're in your head and you're stressed and you're crazy. Like they can help you take that step back. Um, cause if I didn't have that, I would be just a neurotic mess all the time. So I've got a, I've got a balance now. I just, I'm still working on it. And I think I'll probably continue to be working on that for the rest of my life. <laughs> Well, uh, first off, congratulations. I wish many more blissful years for you, you. and your significant other. I really do. That's awesome. Um, yeah, you know, I, I just, I feel like that was an important question to ask because, you know, me being in college and my schedule, I, I have 21 credit hours. Uh, I work full time overnight for the lottery and I also work a part time as well doing event security and do the other stuff as well. So my time management has to be on 200. So my thing is when I dedicate time for something like that to go out and do something and it doesn't go as the plans that I wanted to go, it's just devastating. It is. Mm -hmm. And I just had to ask someone from a professional standpoint of, I mean, how do you deal? I mean, because mental health is so important. Um, you know, at some point, you know, I've, I've had editors because I know my editor here, the one I told you that asked me to cover the game, he did that a couple more times in the season. And there would have to be a point where I said, hey, uh, JV, I need you to, uh, I need a day off, man. I, I, I need just a Friday off. I don't want to cover no games. I don't want to do nothing. And he said, you know, you're normally my guy. You're normally my go-to guy. I was like, I feel you, but I got to have that day off. Has there ever been a time like that where you kind of had to like put your foot down and say, hey, you know, Stormy needs a day off. <laughs> I need to like reset. Yeah, actually, very recently that happened to me. And and it's so interesting that you brought this up because I, I also host a podcast that we recently started under the team's umbrella called Game Misconduct. Um, and it kind of like centers on amplifying other women's voices in sports. And I talked to Catherine Tappan of NBC, who's a host and reporter there. And she said that the best advice that she could go back and give herself before she really um, took off in this career 
was that it's okay to say no sometimes. You don't have to say yes to everything. And that really hit home for me because I have been such a yes, yes, yes person. Like, yes, I can do it. I'll make it work. I want the experience. I could use extra money, whatever the, the in whatever the reason is, right. um, whether it was, you know, reps or finances or whatever. Like I always said yes, because I feel like there's so much you can gain from doing different experiences and trying different things and which is totally true, but right. you can yes yourself to death too. And then all of a sudden it's always expected that you're the person that can go to. Right. And sometimes that'll take a big toll on you. And this past summer, I um, worked for the Golden Knights, uh, as you said, that's my primary job. And this summer when there was no hockey going on, I still had like my normal duties around the office and everything. But because I had so much free time, like on air wise, the team was very nice and let me freelance to do college football sidelines for ESPN. And I also did some um, anchoring work for a sports betting network here in town called Beeson. Okay. And I was doing three jobs at once. And at times I would have multiple college football games the same week wow. and balancing. So I'd have a game on Friday and Saturday or Thursday and Saturday. And I'd be balancing out all of the production calls and interviews with different players and coaches while doing my job with the Golden Knights and also hosting these sports betting shows that cover like five different sports. And so it was just like my brain was like a mashed potato. And so <laughs> I did like I had like one week where I was just talking to my mom and I was talking to my boyfriend and my dad. And I was like, I, I think I just need to tell everybody I just need a break. I just need a week off before the hockey season really gets going again, where I can just kind of lay around and do nothing. <laughs> and so I did that and it was kind of hard for me to do. And after like three days of it, I was like, oh, okay, I can get back to work now. But I did, I really needed that step back because my mind was just overloaded. My calendar was overloaded. And I don't think that you're gonna be at your best when you're that overwhelmed either. So it is important, like you said, just to say, hey, like I need a, I need a Friday. I need I need a day that I can just have a beer, you know, mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. In <laughs> so my case, probably a shot of Hennessy, maybe a couple hey, shots of Hennessy. There you go. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, I, I needed that. Cause I, like I said, I worked full time. And at that point last fall, I didn't have seven, but I had six classes. And yeah, I'm like, you know, I, I, I I need a break, baby. I mean, I feel you that I'm your go-to guy. And I, I listen, I told him, I said, I'm glad you have that much trust in me. I'm pro I, I honestly do. And I've been going for you, but I need a Friday off. I just need this one day off because I'm also doing yeah. event security. It's just, it's, at some point, it's like, yo, I need to reset and shut it's down. It's great to be relied on, but you have to, like you said, give yourself that mental health day or give yourself that breath when you need it. It's very important. I agree. And this is a great segue to this question because I want to ask, has there ever been a time in your life where you no longer wanted to do sports reporting? And if so, how did you exhibit the resiliency to not quit? So it wasn't that I ever wanted to stop, but I definitely reached a path where I was scared about not being able to get work. And, okay. um, that was a that was definitely a, a challenge for me. I moved from Colorado where I was living at the time in my first job um, that I had worked for three and a half years. I was very comfortable in, but I wanted to branch out and I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina without a job. Um, and I got a sports editing job really quickly, but obviously my goal was to be on air. That's what I really wanted to do. And so right. I was sending my tape out everywhere and I was really scared because there were a couple like, and I'm fortunate that my lull was a couple months and not a couple years that other people have to fight through to see if they're still going to be cut out for this industry. Right. Um, but it was a few months there where like I was getting a lot of no's, I was getting a lot of no responses and it takes a toll on your confidence yeah. um, big time when you keep hearing no, 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 or we don't have anything or, you know, try again later when you have a stronger tape or when you've gotten more experience in this area it's really hard to hear um when you right. feel 
feel like they're ready for that next step and it's just not coming. Um, And so that was something where like, again, I was very fortunate that I have good people in my corner that when I was feeling a lack of confidence in myself, that I had them there saying like, no, you're, you got your first job a lot easier than other people get their first job. So instead of having that out of college where you had this lull of trying to figure out what you're going to do, you just got it after your first job. So like, I feel like I still ended up getting that, that taste of reality that I think most people get when they're struggling to find that first opportunity. That was me struggling to get my second and third opportunity. And honestly though, I stuck with it and I just never stopped emailing and cold calling people and trying to do things on my own to make my tape stronger or to I'd put a game up and I'd mute the TV at halftime and like ask my own halftime interview questions to myself because I'm a psycho but like those types of things just to keep it working and keep my gears turning for the industry and it eventually worked out thankfully (laughs) um, that I haven't had to stop doing what I love to do Um, but yeah definitely like when your confidence takes a hit it's hard to see if you're still meant for this. And I have so many friends and so many people I went to school with that aren't doing this job anymore because of those things. Right. And so I just count my blessings every day. I still get to do it. And I hope that I continue to get to do it for a long time. So do I. And I think you're terrific at what you do. Uh, you <laughs> obviously work hard. Um, so there's no question about it. There's a reason why you were selected, like I said. So yeah, I hope you continue doing it too. Um, before I get to the next question, uh, I want to tell you a story. Um, I had a moment where I didn't know whether or not I wanted to uh, continue with sports. And it's after my first internship. So my first internship was with the Knoxville Ice Bears. It was a game day internship. And at the time, um, I had started school a little bit late. I had graduated from high school and I started school at, at 23. As a freshman, and now I'm a 28-year-old senior. Um, so I already had a little bit of anxiety about starting that late anyway. But at the same time, I gave my resume, my cover letter to the Atlanta Falcons career fair. They called me. They said, hey, Chris, can you finish out the season with us? I said, sure. I said, hell yeah. I've never been called for a sports job in my life. So I wanted to see what it was about. So I had no car, though. And I had no, I didn't have my own place. I lived in my mom's house. And I just started a full-time job that now I'm at a different position. But back then, I was working eight to five, There's no more business hours, and going to school online full-time. So this is how I got to Knoxville. I would take an Uber to the Marta station. After the Marta station, I would take the mega bus from Atlanta to Knoxville, which is four hours. I would get off the mega bus and it would take the Knoxville Transit to either the Super 8 or the Motel 6, whichever hotel was cheaper for that weekend. I did it for the next three and a half months. But during that time, uh, I would probably say maybe a month and a half, almost two months, I was in a hotel room coming home one Friday night and I was just tired. And I was saying to myself, what the hell am I doing this for? Like, this is, like, it's unpaid. I'm doing will call tickets. Uh, I'm running around with kids as they play hockey. I'm telling kids to stop being so, you know, physical in a bounce house because you know how kids are in a bounce house. They go crazy. Uh, and I'm like, is this what I got to do to break into sports? Because I never thought that this is be my route. And literally, story, I, I could not go to bed because I was really thinking about quitting. And I sat up for the next two hours. And I finally came to a decision to where I said, okay, I'm not going to quit this because I don't quit anything that I start. I'm going to finish it out. Um, and then he's going to write me a good recommendation because I'm just going to bust my ass and work hard. So I finished it out. He did write a good recommendation. He taught me a lot of traits, including patience, because I thought I was a patient man before I did that job. But I <laughs> instantly got more patient doing that. Um, Fast forward a few years later, um, now I have my own place, which I'm sitting in right now. Uh, I have my own car, which is bought off, which is great. And I'm getting a degree in uh, five months in July. 
but it stemmed from that conversation, not conversation, but that moment of, I did not know if I want to do this, because I'm like, if I would have quit that, I, I don't know what other internships or opportunities I would have thought of that would have came my way, like the writing opportunity for the publication. Um, I had that on my resume, gave it to the sports editor, and gave him some of my clippings because I joined the staff magazine afterward. I just don't know what would have happened. So I wanted to tell you that story before I got to the next question. No, you should be very proud of yourself for that perseverance and like, look at where you're at now. That's incredible. You're about to graduate with this incredible degree. You're on yeah. your own. You're doing it. Like, that's fantastic. I'm so excited for you. I appreciate that story. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask this question because this is a fun question. I want you to tell me what is your favorite memory that you've done in the industry thus far and why? You can give me two if you can't think of one. Oh, there's, you don't understand. See, this is hard because you're putting me on the spot and I feel like I have so many just really good memories. Um, there's one that was really impactful really early in my career. My first year of my first job, um, I got to cover the Fiesta Bowl um, oh, wow. with the Mountain West Conference. And so that was just at the time I was like fresh out of school. It was four or five months into my first job and I got to go to a New Year's Six Bowl. Um, cool. and, yeah, and that was just like, that's something that I'll always really, really look back on fondly. Um, when I was offered my current job, I think that's another one that was just a really, really freaking awesome moment for me. Um, I'm, I'm originally born and raised here in Las Vegas. And okay. so uh, when I was going through the interview process and audition process for this job, I kept on trying not to get too ahead of myself and too excited about it because I didn't have any hockey experience prior to this job. And so right. I didn't really know if I would get this opportunity just to be a part of the interview process was so incredible. Um, and then when I, after I had gone through everything and like I got the call and they were explaining their reasons why I was the selected person for the job and why they were so excited for to have me on, I like hung up the phone and started crying. I was just so excited that I got to come back and, and cover a team that is the team that got me interested in hockey and to be around my family and for the first time since I really started this career path have a job I could share with them um was just really really incredible and so like even now just thinking about that moment I'm getting kind of like shivers up and down my body it was really really it was a really cool moment for me but there are so many honestly like that's just like a very emotional one for me but I've been super super fortunate to have like really unique job opportunities that have um, that have ma made for very cool experiences. Um, and I feel bad that I'm singling any out, but that one's definitely huge for me. Oh, no, uh, there, there's no question that there would definitely uh, be tears coming down my eyes if I ever got a chance to go back home to San Diego and uh, either cover the Padres or do the Chargers uh, yeah. because that's home. Uh, that's, some, that's a place that I've always loved. I mean, getting into the sports industry, I might tear up too, because I'm like, man, I know how much I've been grinding and wanting to be in it so bad. And um, I still do. I just have a passion for it. I just love it so much. I'm I happy love to hear too that you're still a Chargers fan, even though they left to LA. I know there are so many people that like jumped off that ship after because they felt so hurt that the team left. But like, I still love rooting for the chart. I'm a 49ers fan, like just my whole life. But from right. living in San Diego for as long as I did, like I did totally have that affinity for the Chargers. And I still do, even though they left. I was sad about it, but I'm glad Very you sad. Oh, excuse me. Very sad. Um, you know, they didn't want to give us a new stadium. I totally understand that. But, exactly. you know, once a Charger fan, always a Charger fan. You know, I love it. I, I'm going to root for them all the time. And it will be special if I get a chance to cover them. Uh, no question about it. So. I like that answer. I really do. Because it's not, it's a rarity. It's a rarity that people get to come back to their home town and cover their home, their home team. So that's pretty cool. Pretty awesome. Um, the next question, I asked you about your favorite memory. Now I'm going to ask you about what is an event that you would like to cover, but you simply haven't yet. And why? 
Um, there's a lot too. I feel like there, I have a lot that I still want to accomplish in my career. Um, I'm very fortunate for where I am at my age, no question, but, um, there's still like a lot of things I would like to do. Um, I'm sure that my bucket list events are bucket list events for most people. So I'm not unique in this, but getting to cover an Olympic games, I think oh, would yeah. be absolutely a dream come true yeah. covering a super bowl covering a stanley cup final a final a final four i'm a big college basketball person and so if i were ever to be a part of like a marquee final four type of an event like that would be incredible um so all of those things are you know bucket list events that i hope to one day be a part of in my career which which again we're hoping is long and it's not oh gone. yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, and, and with the way that you work hard, the way that you're going, it's going to be long. There's no question oh, about it in my mind. You definitely going to have you. a long career. You are Do you very have any well. marquee events that you would like to get to cover? Uh, you, you said you said three of them for sure. Uh, the Olympics is one. Um, personally, I would like to cover the Olympics when they come to the U.S. I believe they're doing that in 24. Um, I would love to do that. If I'm in the industry, that'd be great. Um Super Bowl because of my dad. Uh, that has a lot of sentimental to me uh, because I, I can remember him and I watching many Super Bowls together. And I told him two years ago, sitting in the kitchen um, when I was visiting him for Christmas, I said, Dad, you know, I'm going to be a sports reporter and a writer, and I, I'm going to take you to the Super Bowl. I'm going to cover the Super Bowl, and I'm going to take you to the Super Bowl. And he looked at me kind of funny. He said, what the hell are you talking about? You ain't going to eat you're not going to take the Super Bowl. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like, I'm, my goal and plan is to bust my ass to try to get into this industry. I'm going to graduate with a degree, and I'm going to take you to the Super Bowl because we've always watched Super Bowls together. And how special would it be for you and me to stand side by side together at the Super Bowl? And he looked at me kind of nostalgic, and he said, if you do that, you'll never have to do anything for me ever again because he loves that. He just loves the Super Bowl. So. Olympics, Super Bowl, and uh, Final Four. Selfishly, I just want to be at a Final Four. I was pissed that we had the Final Four here in Atlanta. I had tickets, and I was ready to go to the championship game, and then COVID happened. I was like, oh, oh my God, it. that's heartbreaking. It I'm is. like, for real, when the NCAA tournament was canceled, it was like Christmas was canceled. Yeah. I was so sad. So oh. I feel your, I had tickets. Oh, my gosh. The championship game. I actually oh. I went. I saved. My, I was saving money. Uh, I bought some tickets. It was like two hundred a piece, two hundred something a piece. I bought two. I was gonna be sitting in a decent section, not way up there, but in the middle. And I was like, "Cool, we're gonna go to the final four, baby." I never been to the championship game. And all of a sudden, I get a email saying, "Well, the final four has been canceled." So I was like, okay. "I'm so sad for you." Yeah. There will be another time. There will be another time. It just wasn't my time. That's what I said. It wasn't my time, but I will be there. So th to answer your question, those are the three for me. Um, the next question I have is about moving around. So you've done that. Um, and I wanted to know, because professors, they always stress about, Chris, you got to, uh, when you get your first job, you're probably going to start in a very small market in a city that you never heard of. And I was like, okay, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, but then they'll say, well, you might have to get used to that small market because you may never get to a big market. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold up, ma'am, sir. I ain't built like that. I don't know what the hell y'all two talking about, but I want to go into the biggest market and do my thing. I, I don't want to just settle for the small. Not to disrespect the small, because the small market, it may be a great thing, and I may want to say that. I may change my mind. But I'm striving to be the best of the best. I want to break down as many doors and bust many windows as I possibly can. I want people not to just know my name, but I want them to know my impact and feel my impact into this industry. And that's exactly what I want. And I told my professors that. So I just, basically, I told them, I never say never. I don't want to put never on. So I ask you this, is it better to move around uh, to ascend as far as your career goes, or is it better to get in one spot and ascend among the ranks? 
You know, I think everybody's path is different and I understand where your professors are coming from trying to set this realistic expectation, yada, yada, yada. But I don't, I think that I wouldn't be doing the career path I was doing if I set my goals in the realistic. I think that you have to aspire to greater things to be able to push yourself and like get comfortable yeah. being uncomfortable. I'm a very firm believer in that, that you only get better and you only grow if you're uncomfortable. Right. Um, and so, yes, like I totally understand going to a, a small market area first because like you need to be able to make mistakes on a small scale. And I had the fortune of doing that instead of going to a, like a small market, small town I'd never heard of, um, went to Colorado Springs, which is actually like always ranked as one of the top 10, top 20 cities in America to live. It's a very beautiful, beautiful place. And so yes, it like four minutes outside of Denver. Um, and so I was fortunate that I was able to get my start there because I was working for a digital um, conference network. So the Mountain West Conference, I was working for their um, digital network at the time. And so that was my first start. I had never been to Colorado before, but I got the call and moved there two weeks later. So, um, wow. but you do, I think you have to be able to um, have the willingness to move anywhere. Because like I said, I was living in San Diego, moved to Colorado, went from Colorado to Charlotte, North Carolina, went from Carolina to Las Vegas, Nevada. So like I have moved around a lot, and I was fortunate too that I, like my significant other and I have moved together. Like I'm, uh, he moved from North Carolina to Las Vegas with me, which is another really hard thing I think to find is somebody who understands your lifestyle and That's that their, their job and their life has to, in a lot of ways, if we're going to be in this together, um, be linked to your, your job. Um, right. And like, that's a, that's a hard thing to have somebody if they're very career driven as well to say that they can just quit their job and pack up and move with you on a whim to follow your dreams. Um, and so that's definitely um, another thing about like me feeling fortunate that I found a special person that's been willing to make those moves with me because it is a very scary thing to pick up and move somewhere new by yourself, which I had done, but it's nice to have someone in my corner now when I'm taking those steps. Um, and I, I, I think as far as markets go, I don't think you should necessarily look at the number of the market and have that be what determines your like self-worth by any means. Right. Um, but right. like, I was so fortunate to make those mistakes on this digital network that the first time I was on a national broadcast on ESPN, I didn't make those mistakes and I, I didn't feel like I was going to embarrass myself in front of X, Y, Z thousand people, you know? Right. Um, right. And I think that's important to be able to learn on a smaller scale and then take those skills and take what you learn and continue to make those moves. I like that. I really do like that answer, but I, and I mainly ask that question because professors always talk about, um, market size and for me i mean hell i don't i don't know one two hundred markets i know there's big cities i know there's big places i know obviously there's uh states that you live in that's gonna have multiple teams uh the states that you live in that's gonna have maybe one team i know that um and i ask that because my main thing has always been if i'm going to move around uh I got to be conscientious as an African American man about, especially where I move. Um, you know, there's, there's going to be certain places. I feel personally, and I want to say this, I feel personally, I can live anywhere because I can adapt to any surrounding. I feel like I can make friends with anybody. I'm just a peaceful kind of guy. I feel like no matter who you can talk to, you can always find one thing in common with them and then bounce off that one thing and start a conversation. I feel that personally. But um, it's tough because there's people around you that may not feel the same way, you know? Um, so I definitely take conscientious to that and moving into different markets and stuff like that. So I ask the question all the time, what is, you know, that So I like the answer though. Now I have two more questions. You've been really good, Stormy. I really do appreciate it, Jim. This next question is about interviews. 
Um, I have a love-hate relationship with online sites like Team Work Online, Work in Sports, Sports Journalism, all that. Because I feel like when you get your cover letter together, your resume together, you apply for the job posting, that you're sending it into space, you don't know who's reading it, you don't know where it's going, you don't know anything. And I feel like a lot of these companies put their job postings up for legal purposes. Um, you know, because they already know who their inside man or woman is or their connect that they want to give the job to. Um, so I ask, I say that to ask this, what is the best way for someone to get interviews with companies? Is it going online or is it emailing hiring directors, producers at stations, affiliates or teams, or is it talking with talented professionals like yourself building a connection? I think it is a total mixed bag. Um, and I have had experience getting jobs and not getting jobs through all of those different ways. Okay. Um, a place like Teamworks Online and those types of things, um, it just depends on the company or the team that it's going to because you're dead on. Yes, sometimes there is one of those things that's put up as a formality and they have to interview X amount of people, but they already have their person in mind that they told to apply and they want to um, that they want to talk with. I have been on the side of being one of the people that was on the inside that would potentially get that role, but they still said that they had to interview other people through this process. I've also been one of those people that was an outsider applying for a random job that got an interview for that thing and the person didn't end up getting that role, I did. So right. Right. they, I think that a lot of those companies take the proper steps regardless, that they're not just interviewing people for a formality all of the time and that they're not, you're not just sending your application into space. If you want to ensure the fact that you're not sending your application into space, yeah. I would take the extra step and go to that team or that company's um, staff directory and not necessarily just find hiring manager, but different people that are in that um, like division where you're trying to work, whatever that sector is, and shoot like personalized one-off emails to those people, not just saying like, oh, hey, here's my resume, I applied for this job, but right. saying why you think you're a good fit for it, essentially make your email a cover letter. Okay. Um, so instead of like attaching the cover letter and resume, maybe attach your resume, but sell yourself in the body of the email. Um, something else that I have done a lot is um, sending those blind emails to people, um, but not for anything, like not for a specific job, right. but more so to build the relationships like we're doing here. Mm -hmm. um, and just asking if you can do kind of an informative interview and just get to know that person and I did that a ton when I moved to Charlotte and was trying to like find that next job. I was just emailing and cold calling a bunch of different coordinating producers or web managers for different teams, um, a ton of different people and just trying to continue to establish that relationship later. So I would like go meet somebody for coffee and yeah. send like a thank you follow-up email and then three weeks later i'd have like a reminder set in my calendar just to hey say hi to so and so and remember something um that was personal in the conversation that you guys said before that you could check back in on like oh how's your son's um like football team doing i hope that you you know whatever that little connection was to make it still personal to show you paid attention and to show you're not asking for something i right. think is important that you are developing a connection, like you said, because those more often than not are going to pay off in the long run. But in order to get those connections, a lot of time, you do have to send the blind email like you did to me, you do have to send the, um, the, the cold call to get somebody on the phone sometimes to establish that connection. Because like, I didn't start in this business with a network, like, I didn't know anybody who did what I did, what I wanted to do. I didn't, have an in at a company or anything. I just really had to try to create that on my own. And right. it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of people ignoring you, but if you do it enough, uh, hopefully it'll start to pay off. 
That's very true. Um, I, like I said, I started last uh, December really trying to reach out to people. My goal in doing this was to really kind of reach out to different people in different roles. Um, but not only reach out to people in different roles locally, I wanted to reach out to people in different roles uh, to the whole U.S. You know, anchors, producers, directors, reporters, writers, right. all the above. Uh, because I want to hear not only your stories, but your advice, because everybody that I've talked to has had a different path on getting into this industry. Uh, it's amazing. I mean, you, you would think there's only so many paths you can, people can take, but it's really like interesting how people are getting into the path. And you said something that was uh, like the cold calling and the emailing. You're right. Um, typically, part of me always is a little bit hesitant. You know, I send the email anyway because, yes, I would like to talk to you. I really would because I think you're talented. Uh, but I also understand your schedule. So part of me was like, okay, she works for the Las Vegas Knights. Let me look up their schedule and see when she's not <laughs> on game day and when she's not working. Like, and I literally did that um, because I knew I didn't want to bother you. You said what? Yeah, no, I'm just gonna say that's a very important part of it. Like if you are reaching out to a coordinating producer who covers college football for ESPN, don't reach out like the week of their, you know, the championship, you know, right. <laughs> like right. pick your moments. No, I think that timing is definitely part of that battle. You're, you're dead on in that sense. Yeah, and I've, I've done that tremendously uh, with, with teams, with ESPN and stuff like that. Cause I respect your time. Uh, I didn't want to uh, email too much <laughs> and ask. I just wanted to let one time go because, you know, you guys are very busy in the professional field. So I just want to respect your time. And whenever you can get back to me, it's great. I was like humble and blessed and appreciative, like I said before, that you responded to. It's been great. Um, I'm going to get you out of here on this question. And that is, what is some advice that someone has given you or you have allocated someone that is up and coming in the sports media industry that you hold, that holds close to your heart? Um, there are a couple things. I think one, um, which I firmly like believe not only in our industry, but like living your life by is work hard and be nice to people. Um, like, I think that you need to be nice to ev everyone that you meet. I get that there's, everyone can have a bad day um, and you're, you're not going to be walking on cloud nine all day, every day. But right. I don't think that that means you should take it out on anybody else either, especially in a work environment. Um, there are so many people that have to work really, really hard to get me on air, whether it's my cameraman or my producer or my audio technician or whatever. And I feel sick to my stomach when I hear stories of reporters not being respectful to those people or getting people fired or like, it's just mind blowing to me. So be okay. kind to people, treat everybody as you would want to be treated. It's something you learn as a little kid that I think there's a lot of value in, yep. but at the same time, like you do need to really work hard and like getting ju just being nice. Isn't the only answer. Like you have to put in the work and be nice. Yes, um, and then what kind of like a physical tangible thing that I got really great advice from, from another reporter early on in my career, um, her name is Shannon Spake. She, works for Fox Sports and covers NASCAR and the NFL. Um, and she's just incredible. But her advice was think like handwritten thank you cards. And so after I work a college football game, for example, I like to write handwritten thank you cards to the sports information director who helped me to the coaches that I interviewed. Um, and a lot of times you actually get a handwritten thank you note or an email back from those people. And it's really, really cool that shows that not only like, did you put the, uh, the work in and like take the extra step to do something that not most people would do, but that right. they did it back to you. And now you have like a little bit of, of, a little bit more of a connection than you would have before. So I'm a big proponent of handwritten thank you notes. I like that. Okay. I think that's also a first. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say about the handwritten thank you notes, but that's pretty cool. Uh, this, it just personalizes how you feel uh, even more than a, maybe a text message or a handshake or just a simple thank you. Uh, I really do appreciate that advice. That's for sure. Um, I am following you, Stormy, on Instagram.
Instagram and Twitter. And I promise you, I'll probably follow you on LinkedIn too. Those are the three I use. So yep. I me definitely too. want to, uh, if you want to follow me back, you most certainly can. I would love that. Um, and if not, I understand, but I always throw that out there. Always. So um, I also want to send you some of my reels. When I do get my news package stuff up, yeah. I'd love to hear some critiques from you. Uh, I know you're in season, so it's whenever I hear from you, it's great. It doesn't matter. Uh, you can bash it to hell if you want to. It doesn't matter. Uh, I love it. I'll, just love, I'll be happy if you just take a look at it. That'd be awesome. No, um, of course. I have absolutely, like, I do that all the time. Still even send clips to people that, um, that I know have been in that situation or critique. Like, I absolutely love getting my own constructive criticism and feedback and so I'm always down to look over anything that you have honestly like it's such a big part of what makes us better so totally send it away you've got my email that's awesome and then the last thing I want to say is I do graduate in July I'm going to be looking at a whole lot of places a plethora of applications if you hear of anything not just with the team or an affiliate or in the city that's whatever in the battle uh please don't be afraid to shoot it my way because uh, there'd be nothing better than to come back to the West Coast. That's for sure. For sure. Definitely keep in touch. And it was a pleasure getting to know you a little bit. Best of luck and all your future endeavors. I can tell that you're a total go-getter. And I know great things are going to happen for you in the future, Chris. Thank you very much, Stormy. Please do not be a stranger. And uh, go night. And take care. Have a great day. Good night. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> take care.